to be clear, you have won two, not one, two World Elk Calling titles. Well, I would say that a lot of it has to do with that high level of turkey calling, man. In every way, turkey calling is a higher level of running a mouth call, and I don't care what anyone says. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Drury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. Powered by DeerCast and a first form energy there. Matt's already right. cracking a cold one. That's right. It was a long week. Uh, I'm Tim Chelsvik. <laughs> I'm Matt Drury. And we have a special series that we're bringing for turkey season. And we have a special guest in house. That's right. We have Mr. Steve Stoltz. Steve. He's went, So Steve's been uh, associated with Drury Outdoors in some form or fashion since the very beginning. Day one. St- you know, Drury Outdoors, Mad Calls, very instrumental on that side of things. And Steve, so last year we did the Longbeard Legend series. I want to set mm. this up real quick. We're calling this series the Young Gun series. It's a cool title. And the year before we did the Longbeard Legend series. Yes. That's right. And so last year we really took the approach of we had guys, well, Ray I, a Longbeard Legend uh-huh. in and of himself. He came in and he co hosted that with us. And we had guys like Will Primos, Cus Strickland, er- Ernie Calandrelli, uh, Chris Kirby, who was just recently inducted into the uh, Grand National Hall of Fame. Yeah, Grand National Hall of Fame, Ron Jolly. So we really highlighted some of those guys that helped set up what we know now as the the outdoor industry, the hunting industry, yeah. and very instrumental uh, in, in the turkey side of it specifically. And so as I sat back and we kind of looked towards this spring, I thought, you know, what would be interesting is if we took a new approach and said, hey, who who's the next group? Who's that next crop of guys coming up? The young guys that are really doing it right. They're using new technology. They're, um, uh, you know, out there helping teach people the younger demographic the things that that old group the long beer legend group Mm -hmm. taught back in the 80s and 90s yeah so that's really what i thought we could dive into and i thought it'd be great to have steve here who is a long beard legend in in many ways i i I would bet money there's going to be a day where you're going to be a grand national hall of famer Uh, i don't know about that well you could say that but that that's what politicians Look, I always can't, say. I can't imagine anybody role. that's called at a high level for as long as you have competition calling. Like real quick, you know, I know you're going to love this, but can you give us just a highlight of some of your accolades over the years for somebody that may not know? Well, I started in 79 and since 1979 to what is this year? 2024. When you get old, you forget <laughs> the years. I have literally placed in a top five or won a calling contest every year since 1979. Holy heck. Those pictures of you back in the day, when you had hair and you were wearing like the, 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 the mustache was on That point. hat, that cowboy hat. Oh, yeah. That was like uh, straight out of Smokey and the Bandit or mm-hmm. something. Like, I love those pictures, man. But I won uh, my big, uh, two big breaks. In, in 1987, I won the Levi Garrett All-American Regional. Big money contest. Butsky, Walter Parrott, all of them were there. Mm-hmm. Um, that was my first big win, placed in the U.S. Open several times. And then your Uncle Mark, Mark Drury himself, the mad scientist, won the World Turkey Calling Championship in 1992. Okay. And in case anybody don't forget... Mark was a fierce competitor back then. He, he still is a fierce <laughs> competitor. <laughs> Another <laughs> candidate, in my opinion, for the Grand National Turkey Calling Hall of Fame. For sure. Yeah. Uh, and, but any, anyway, Mark talked me into going to the 1993 World Turkey Calling Championship. Your grandpa Ralph and your grandma Lucille was right there in the then, front row. And I won that. 52 callers that year, I won that Turkey Calling Championship, my first World Turkey Calling Championship. And so it's been a great turkey calling career. I've not been the winningest in majors, but uh, I think I've been pretty consistent. I tell you what, I was talking to Mark and Terry a couple weeks back. We were at a uh, Missouri uh conservation federation uh, banquet and we were having some cocktails afterwards and mark was telling us that you had how great you sounded down there in uh nashville yeah. the grand nationals he was like man steve's calling at a very very high level yeah you know my scores are coming out and they're right with uh your map well math and size is tough tough to the to goat beat. the <laughs> goat but they're right with the josh grossenbachers and the 
Jesse Martins and the Dave Owens of the world. Um, and my scores are right there. So a lot of people have said, well, when are you going to retire? Your wife. <laughs> <laughs> people. AKA. Well, the answer is, and I think, Bo, you'll agree. The answer is, uh, is, is if those scores keep coming out and they're just as good as some of your top callers, why, why quit? Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I'm absolutely. having fun with it. Well, so speaking of fun, uh, Steve, you just mentioned Bo. Bo yes. has been patiently a little <laughs> premature <laughs> waiting for us. To that's how we, jump that's on. how we roll here. Right. <laughs> yeah, said. no, we, we are not formal at all. We got Bo Brooks. He's a renowned hunter, professional caller, hunting guide, and wildlife photographer. Bo is a two time world elk calling champ. When it comes to turkeys, Bo specializes in Western state turkey hunting. He's created a turkey. He's uh, created a turkey hunting uh, a calling master class available on Audible. Bo is a Washington State native with a family deeply rooted in the hunting tradition. He's a fan favorite in both elk and turkey calling with a hefty 268,000 followers on Tic Tac. Tic Tac. He's got the Tic Tacs. <laughs> 5.8 million likes over there on Tic Tac and nearly 66,000 followers on Instagram. And he's got blood on his hands from this, this morning's morning. adventure. Bo, Bo welcome. I'm super stoked to be here. Holy cow. <laughs> now that was an intro, but well, well-deserved intro. When, when I was looking through, like I, I try to do quite a bit of research leading into this uh, series because I wanted to make sure we highlighted the right, the right guys. And when I was looking at kind of just surfing the internet over and over and over, your videos kept coming up. And what I found very interesting was the teaching techniques that you were using. And so TikTok, those 5.8 million likes, like, you know, of course there's, you have quite a few vid videos that are going viral and, and you're doing some fun stuff, but a lot of the videos you're teaching people the techniques and the tactics. And that's what I found very interesting. Um, and so anyways, this morning I reached out to you a couple weeks ago. You said, yeah, happy to do it, which we appreciate. And this morning I, I sent Bo a quick reminder on Instagram, a direct message, and uh, he was out hunting. So he, uh, tell us a little bit about your morning before you jumped on, before you had to go find Wi-Fi somewhere and jump on with us. <laughs> Uh, we, um, I just got down to, uh, North Georgia and this is like my favorite place to hunt. Um, one of my favorites in the country and, um, woke up this morning, looked up, no stars. So it was cloudy, kind of humid. We slept out there, um, had, you know, five birds roosted in the spot. They gobbled a little bit on the limb and, uh, I got started getting after them a little bit and started gobbling real good, shut up. And all of a sudden looked up, <laughs> here comes two ropers across the field goblin and uh my two buddies shot him and we wrapped it on up and uh messed with one for a little bit longer and uh man i just it was a good morning Got scratching leaves yelping at birds they're acting right you know it's uh i feel like this year has been a little bit ahead of schedule this warm weather so they're right on the money for at least where i'm at right now so at you talked about you know no stars in the sky and a little humid you know, the, these are some of the things that i you know, I, I think Mark and Terry, Steve, like you guys think about like the weather conditions and high pressure, low pressure, like east winds, like those types of things and how they affect birds. Does that, does that affect them when you're, when there's no cloud, you know, it's all cloudy, it's, it's humid, it's overcast. Is that something that affects them gobbling on the roost? I, I, especially these Southern birds, I, you know, I, we get a hop all around the country, man. I don't know what it is, but it just seems like they're so finicky. I think that the Northern birds are used to being cold and stuff like that. And so they'll, they'll fight through it sometimes, but these just, just like, seems like some days you'll just go out and they just don't gobble very good. So, and so he, he, he gobbled on the limb, but man, it just took a little bit to get them, get their wheels cranking this morning. You know, they're, and I think they know that they're, I, I don't know. And I've, I've hunted with Mark and Mark, is thinks on a deeper level than I will ever think of, about anything. <laughs> he's he's he freaking just he's got it figured out, you know. And we we think the um, same thing, it, same thing here as well. Yeah. He's, he's way ahead of us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's it, it, he's. But I man, I get it, I just I I feel like they know when there's weather blowing in. You know what I mean? It's, especially these birds down here in the southeast. I just it's 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 at home. My turkeys I grew up hunting. If, as long as it's not raining, they're going to be gobbling. Mm -hmm. Down here, you could you could look at them the wrong way with the with the wind could blow the wrong way, and they're like, "Oh man, oh, I'm not feeling it this morning. <laughs> got to wait till eight or nine o'clock to start gobbling." I just I just got back from Alabama, a, a southern turkey tour, 
uh, and I was gone yeah. for almost two weeks, Bo, Alabama and Mississippi, yeah. and in 11 days, I only watched four turkeys die. Mm. So you've already, you've already done double that <laughs> or uh, half that in, uh, in one morning. So you're doing pretty good. South is tough. What I've always said about the South, if you want, if you want a, 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 a school on turkey hunting, hunting turkeys, go South spend a, a week or three or four days or whatever you need going to turkey hunt down there and as you travel north it gets easier <laughs> mm. i'm glad i'm in the north <laughs> <Go to> Minnesota, <laughs> then. They act <laughs> hey bo you, it, you, you, go ahead it, it's especially man i i totally agree with you i've learned a lot through the years hunting um you know mississippi like i i we hunted this weekend and this past weekend in mississippi and those you know, you always hear from everyone, everywhere you go, they're the hardest turkeys they've, they've ever hunted. But I can honestly say, I think that those southern turkeys, when they get out of the egg, they're just more finicky. They just have, like, with the weather and everything like that, for whatever reason, obviously there's so much pressure down here. But even, like, I was hunting the other day on a very uh, – it had a lot of land, like 1,200 acres. I was right in the middle of it. They shouldn't have been getting messed with. But they still aren't gobbling. You know, for whatever reason, it's not from pressure. You know, I've hunted them on, on public where they're getting pressure really hard down there too. And it's just, man, they're just, they're just weird. And they they don't give your, their gobbles away very easily. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it, I feel me, like it, they don't gobble as different. much too, uh, Bo. Um, I they, agree. they just, I agree they just that. don't. Um, and, and, and they'll, I'll be the first to tell you, uh, probably Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, all South, even Florida. Uh, if they've got any hens with them at all, they almost either zero gobble or just maybe once or twice. They will not gobble much once they got a hen with them. Mm -hmm. So, so I got a yeah, question for you in regards to this morning then. So if they're, you know, they're just slow firing, they're not really hammering off the, on the roost there. What is your, like, what's your go-to and how you approach your calling, you know, how often or what type of calling, what are you doing to try to entice them or to try to at least let them know where you're at and, uh, you know, maybe convince them once they fly down to, to start heading your direction? Like, what's the, you know, what's your kind of cadence there? So, um, it's, it, it really depends. I'm, I, the way I approach birds down here versus other places is a lot different. I'm a, I scratch leaves a lot and I'm, I'm clucking and purring. Just, I'm just letting them know because I, you know, first thing off the roost, it seems like about anywhere you go. A lot of times, if you don't get them right off the roost, as soon as they hit the ground, they're going to be messing around with their hands. And you just got to wait them out. You know what I mean? And just give them time and just let them know you're there. Um, I do feel them out. Like I'll get a little, like, little excited and hit the cock, 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 and see if I can get that hen fired up a little bit. But if she's not answering me right away, I'm, <laughs> I'm not, I don't like, I just notice those hens will steer them the wrong way, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I'm, I'm really conservative. I, what was so interesting to me is I grew up hunting East, I mean, um, turkeys out West. And so Miriam's and Rio's, it just, everything means more to an Eastern than it does a Miriam. So when I scratch on the ground or the, I'm very purposeful with my calling. So, you know, just a, the slightest is, ah, 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 ah. and then, then letting him just chew on that for about 10, 20 minutes can just drive him insane. Where if I was doing that at home, those turkeys would, they just walk off. Yeah. You could <laughs> almost bow out uh, West where you're used to. And, and in Rio country, uh, you can almost just, call to them every time they they answer back and uh you'll still be fine they're still they're still interested in yeah, call. Yeah. all the way to the gun barrel it's yeah, kind of, yeah. I, i'm not gonna lie i love hunting turkeys like that <laughs> i don't <laughs> think that anyone you know, yeah, hear that on the internet all the time they're so dumb i wouldn't i'd never hunt them i'm like well you don't like hunting turkeys very much they don't like hearing them gobble uh, <laughs> yeah that's the fun part i've <laughs> always said the most impressive of any turkey caller, um, uh, you, uh, some of your top callers, we're going to, you know, uh, is the soft calling. And down south, southern birds, learn your soft calling, back off on your calling, call, like Bo's just said, call conservative, and uh, you'll just have a lot better luck. Um, I, I just yeah. went through a hunt where the same thing happened to me, Bo. Uh, had a turkey roosted the night before, believe it or not, he answered not to owl, not to anything, but to a little bit of a soft fly-up cackle. 
And then, yeah. and, it, and then he answered a little tree call and that's in the evening. Now, when I got him roosted the next morning, got 50 yards, even closer to him than where I roosted him from in a pretty spot. And he never gobbled, not one time. Mm. I knew he was there. Yeah. So here I am. I'm, I'm in, I'm in Southern Alabama, almost down to Mobile, Alabama and the Turkey never gobbled on a limb, knew he was there. So I waited to almost got fly down time and did a little tree call and, and him and another one answered. So they would have never answered had I not known they were right there. Hmm. Had, had you not been right there on top of them and got them roosted the night before, you'd have never known there was a turkey in the whole, that entire section of the woods. So that's, can you get- it's, it's really interesting. I, 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 I had the other day, it was raining and I, I know we're getting off on tangents here, but man, I, I was sitting there and my buddy, I, I just had that feeling. It's just not, it was raining and it was just felt humid. And it's just one of those mornings. They weren't gobbling on the limb. I'm like, I didn't, I didn't, and I've been doing this a lot lately. I just would take a wing and don't even, don't even fly up, fly down cackle. Just <laughs> on the side of our gun and you'll sit there and, and he'll, and he answered immediately after. And it's just interesting. Some of those types of things that it's, it's, and you know just as well as I do that not calling, like just doing mm-hmm. things like that, paying the picture without saying anything, can be so effective. I call it the no call call, Bo. Huh. Sometimes <laughs> no calling at all it's a hard one works the best. To do. <laughs> well, that's the interesting, I think, part of it because you guys are talking about woodsmanship, you know, and that's the that's the art of that. That's the part that I think we don't. It's as another the, dimension. It, it is. About, it yeah. is, and that's I think. You know, you guys at the, cl- you know, the class of callers that you are, the woodsmanship to go with it. And I think, you know, that's the next part of what a lot of the rest of us are trying to get towards. It's one thing to sit in front, you know, in a blind with an you know, X decoy in front of you. They look so real and you, you do a little bit of calling, and you kind of wait and waiting it out. Mm-hmm. But you guys are talking about something that it's a it's a game of chess. And, you know, that's that's where I think a lot of guys and hopefully the people listening to this can learn something from what you guys are talking about. And then you talked about getting off on a tangent. But that's exactly why I like doing this series is because it's these types of conversations that I think we have, you know, as as the viewer or our listener at home. Uh, we can learn a lot from it. Right, Tim? Yeah. I mean, you you think about kind of the Mark talks about painting the full picture when it comes to turkey calling. And there's been times like, especially down in Southern Missouri, where the birds aren't gobbling, but they're in the leaf litter and you're listening and they're, they can be loud when they're pecking through there and they're looking for old acorns or grasshoppers or whatever. They can be really loud. And that's their, that's their daily life. Like they're, clocking those things and trying to find out where other turkeys are and uh and so that like when they are not talking and you can paint that other dimension of there's a bird there i want to check out i want to see who it is like that's just a different a different level that we probably don't talk a whole lot because it's fun to call like, it's fun to call it's fun to hear the gobble but there's more to it than that for sure <laughs> so bo uh one of the things that I am so impressed with you and always have been since I first met you is your energy. You bring an energy to the viewer now um, with your following. You bring an energy to your seminars. Talk about what what inspired you to, to, to become a teacher. Every time you speak, and I think it's cool. I, I'm 63 years old, dude. So I, I, I still can learn. I'm not too old to learn. Anybody out here listening on this podcast is trying to learn. Uh, what goes through your mind to uh, when you're wanting to teach? Because you're a very good teacher as far as bringing across the point you want to bring across. I, I, I would, I'll be, I can preface it with the fact that I, not too long ago, was learning. Um, and I had some great people to teach me like yourself and, and, you know, lots of, lots of incredible people that really helped me out. I grew up in a place that turkey hunting wasn't a thing. You know what I mean? Especially if we're just speaking towards turkey hunting. I grew up in a, and I've never heard of a, a next level turkey caller in my entire life till I was 16 and I went to the NWTF um, convention. I, 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 I can I can still remember every I, Jim Pollard was the first person I ever heard turkey call on that next level and I walked up to Jim and I'm like, you know, I need to know how to do that. I, I, and I've always been obsessed with calling, and so it's just the things that 
you guys have taught me Scott Ellis to Mark to Billy Yargis to just all these incredible people that are just incredible in every way have, have just through the years, man, it's, I want to teach the next generation. I see so many things on the internet, in my opinion, and, I, and you can take this for what it's worth, that are te- really terrible, like not godly, not good things. It's just, and I just think, I just re- feel bad for our next generation, not feel bad, but in a way I do feel bad. Like our next generation has it, has it tough. There's a lot of bad influences in this world. I want to see more kids hunting. I want to be the, mm-hmm. I want to be able to help them. I don't want it to feel too intimidating. And I, I learn from videos and I also learn from in person. And it, and I, I'm just, I'm, I'm a student that just wants to keep on giving what I've learned. So, Bo, so. one of the, the sword that cuts both ways when you rise in prominence online is uh, you also get a lot of feedback from people who already know everything. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, cur- <laughs> yeah. I'm curious how, like, what's your standard way of dealing with the detractors, the people the, that, the most, yeah, yeah. The most positive way that I possibly can. That's how I, I, I take it. If anyone has something mean to say, I want to come back with something nice. You know what I mean? If if there, there's too much negativity in this world, and I I have no problems with any person, and um, I remember I remember I grew up around a lot of people that were like that even before social media. Mm. You know, you you be around them, and I just never wanted to be that. I've seen I've been around the, the I've been around the industry since I was a little kid. Um, in general, you know, the big big game industry and whatnot, and I just I just want you know, to be a good example, you know, something that as I looked up out of everybody, I looked up to Phil Robertson the most and mm. he just, the way he lives his life with is, is a way that, you know, I, I think the, the, the way that you should, uh, you should, you should live your Above life. You know what I mean? Just in a <laughs> godly attitude. Funny you had mentioned the, the detractors. I had just saw you on a, one of the I call them the meme pages. I don't know what, you know, the, some of the ones that highlight what everyone that's doing things wrong in the industry do. And it, it's, it goes back to the same thing. And, and we've been guilty of it too. And we've had these conversations internally about it, but u- utilizing um, the debate is around reaping, right. Or use, using decoys that are, you know, help you reap or whatever. And, and boy, there's a lot of detractors around that topic. I understand the safety side of it big time. We've talked, we've had this debate internally yeah. and, and, um, I understand the safety element of it big time. Uh, and that's one of the main things back when I think back in the early videos that we used to create the sound of the sound of the spring and all those, we, we had a whole section on, um, a guy that was out mushroom hunting and he Dramatic was wearing a recreation. flannel red and blue and yeah, we recreated it. And Poor he, yapper. He got, yeah. his yapper. He got shot by a turkey hunter, you know? So <laughs> he didn't I, really get shot yeah. folks. He didn't really get shot. You'd have to go back to, to the, it's in deer cast if you want to see it. But anyway, so I, I get that element of it, but the, the, this particular page they're giving you crap because it's like you you talk about calling and you you have your own line of calls and all this you talk about calling a lot but then they're like oh but he's using this so what which is it he's going to use a he's going to reap which is a whole different it's like man uh, how does that let's be i don't reap either i mean i i have a i use a strutter and i'm just be honest like i've done it it's not necessarily my cup of tea i will never tell someone you know i'll never judge someone for it i have a full strut decoy and I set it out and That's use it like it a decoy. Yeah. And I work for a decoy company to make my living so I'm allowed to hunt. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, the big thing on the internet right now is that I'm not a woodsman. And so I'm just going to – I grew up – I didn't even know what a woodsman was. I grew up elk hunting 45 days a year and sneaking up on giant mule deer. You know what I mean? And spending four hours sitting there. I'm like, so how do I, how do I move around the woods? Mm-hmm. I think it's a lot different here. But like, I, I, and this is I got to I got to tone back the negativity, but it, I'm, it's so fresh right now because people are, man, they're so mean. And they, I'm like, dude, what do I? Well, well Bo, I, mean, what do I, need I, to I think what you, you got, what you got to focus on is the fact that um, to me, that's the few rather than the many. The many are energized by your presence in this industry and, and the great uh your ability to, to be able to teach, your be able your ability to be uh, positive, um, and 
look, the majority, the majority of watching, that's the way they feel. You're just hearing a few negative yeah, comments. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And I and I think that's it's hard to when it's about you, it's hard. It's 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 easy to say I I try to treat everybody with kindness and I I try to live my life, you know, like you were saying like Phil Robertson, you know, whatever. It's easy to say that. It's hard when they're coming after you. And, and it's like, "Dang, man, what did I do to these people?" And it's not, yeah. they don't view it like that. That's the that's the thing about the internet. They just view it like, "Hey, you're just part of the you're part of the industry or you're part of the problem and they're the few yeah. like you say so yeah I, we could move on but i did want to bring that up it's just like hey you know all the positive has to outweigh this stuff i think you know no, I, I i get it all the time with my good looks people are really <laughs> upset by it yeah that's moving sure. right along oh. <laughs> you have enjoyed success in both competitive turkey calling and elk calling which is your favorite mm. Uh, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, to, to, to be clear, you have won two, not one, two world elk calling titles, which is amazing. Yeah. That is a tough competition to win. And uh, yeah. a lot of money paid in that thing, way more than turkey call. And explain a little bit about uh, your, your path to that, to, to that success. Well, I would say that a lot of it has to have to do with that high level of turkey calling, man. It helped me learn how to build calls differently. And it's a, it's a in, in, in every way, turkey calling is a higher level of running a mouth call. And I don't care what anyone says than elk calling. Elk calling is hard, but it's not, it's different. It's very different. And so the, you know, the way we layer latex, everything like that is just, it's taught me so much. Like by the call that I won worlds with the last two years is like a modified ghost cut that doesn't have any overhang and nobody's running anything like that. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's, it's really, I was, I was losing by half a point the years prior. I've been at it for a long time. Really was frustrating. Um, but man, I, I just, I just got lucky the last few years. I, I finally, finally, you know, the, I had the, it's a, it's very, um, you know, I had the right judges. You got to have the right judges. If you know, if someone doesn't like your style, it's just it's just how it goes. But I, I um, then we made a we made a wooden bugle tube too, and it sounds so good. And I think that helped out a lot. But. Well, well, Bo, you're you're like me on stage. You're very emo You're an emotional caller. You um, you put feeling into your calling, and um, I, you know, I I thought you were you know, I feel like uh, you you were. Very competitive. Last time I think I heard you compete was actually at, here in St. Louis at the Mid America Open Turkey Calling Championship, and that was 2020. They have because of COVID, they haven't had one since, and I believe I got yeah. lucky and won that one. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not mentioning because of that. But sure. I, you, I thought you were no, I thought I, Bo, I thought you called really good there. I really did. Um, and I, I, I haven't, I haven't called um, at Grand Nationals for seven years. And I haven't called. I I haven't called since that competition for turkeys. But I I took all my time and effort, and I'm put I put it towards elk because I want to be the first person to win a waterfowl world uh, turkey grand national and elk. I want to I want to have all of them eventually. Mm -hmm. I'm working. I'm, well, I'm working and, and so it. that leads that leads me to my next question. Um, do you, what are your goals uh, as a competitive turkey and elk caller? And I think you just answered that. Yeah, I I'm I'm gonna. I, I've always wanted to be the one that could do, I wanted to always do everything. Like I love calling. I'm so obsessed with this. I love every bit of it. It make, brings me so much closer to everything. And I just, I, I am. Um, and I love to duck hunt. I love to waterfowl hunt, goose hunt. I love the, I love the turkey hunt. And I love to elk hunt. And there, if I'm not calling, I, I, I know that I, you know, I did call in a whitetail this year. I'm not much of a whitetail hunter at all. But I did call one in, and that was pretty cool. I was, I, I thought that they were. It, I mean, still didn't come in very close, but he was looking for me, so thought that was fun. Yeah, but did you use I just love, or... love calling. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did this. I don't know. I don't even know what it, I run it at. I called Mark. I said, Mark, can I call at these things? <laughs> and Mark's like, well, Yeah. And, and I'm like, When do I do it? It's like, oh, when you see him, then do it. Well, I saw him, and I'm like, He's over there on a scrape, so. I'm like, I could do everything. It's not bad. <laughs> and he and he just turned. He started coming towards me. I'm like, oh yeah. I'm like, <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> so we're like, oh, let's get playing. And and uh, it was actually during a rifle season, and and um, I had my bow, and then I also had a gun. And so and he stops, and there, it was I was near like I'm in on the edge of town, so there's houses around, and someone started banging on something. They're working on this other property, and I'm in this big field, and he stops. And he kind of falls out of love, and I'm like, "Huh?" So I grabbed the gun and shot him. <laughs> I went over and grabbed him and ate him. He's, he's been good. Oh. Damn animal! <laughs> ate him in the field. <laughs> uh, Bo is an influencer on digital and social media now. Um, you've got a huge presence. What made you dive into that? What made you start into that part of it? Because I, I'm going to tell you, quite frankly, you've you've gained a lot of momentum quick. So, you know, I'll be completely honest. I've been doing this since I was 16. I don't know. You probably see my videos um, when I was, I mean, I've been filming hunts for a long, long time. They're putting up that. And honestly, they never went anywhere. I put them on Instagram, put them on YouTube, and I've been trying to do it for a long, long time. And then I, then TikTok came out and right off the bat, we put one up and had like 15 million views of me just freaking blowing a spec call. And I'm like, wow, there's something to this. It was my buddy posted it. So I went and started it. I started putting up my elk videos, my turkey videos, and I actually was it was actually getting viewed. And I'm like, awesome. This this is great. And then I'm like, whoa. Well, and I, I was trying to do tutorials before then, but I put it on Instagram and it would just fall flat. Yeah. I mean, Facebook and Instagram for whatever reason, it's just it's really weird. It's the algorithm on it. Now nowadays I've kind of got it figured out more. Both but I wasn't, I, I, and then, man, it's, it's ever since I started getting that momentum and I'm actually seeing the impact that it's having and uh, the amount of kids that come up are like, man, I, I went turkey up for the first time ever and just watch your videos. It's just like, it just, just makes my life, man. And that's the, that's the translation here between those long beard legends and these young guns. So back in the day, it was the VHS title on the rental shelf. It was these DVD or these VHS titles that, you know, you guys were creating back then were teaching people how to hunt. Well, this is the new medium. This is the new way. And, and these young guys are succeeding at putting it out in the ways that people consume that media now. And I think that's, that's the huge difference. Agree. Bo, I'm curious from your perspective, what's the difference in audience and appetite between TikTok and all the other more traditional social channels? Um, it's, I will say that, um, you know, you got, you kind of got to get to your point with everything. You know what I mean? It's, it's really changed. We, we do, uh, we do, we also do, you know, regular, um, TV pursuit channel, sportsman's channel for some of our other stuff. And if we try and take some of that stuff and put it over, it's just too long form, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. And it just doesn't engage. And, and you've got 15 seconds to get people's attention before they're going to drop off. And if you get the attention and the, you build the community, then I, I did one the other day that was eight minutes long on TikTok and people actually watched it. That was kind of a beta test. And it, it but it, you takes all, it, it's a constant flow of content on there that people are trying to, and they're so fast to scroll. If it doesn't appease them or if it doesn't quickly, if it's not something that engages them right off the bat, they're not going to watch it. Yeah. And so it's really just a huge shift in everything in the way that people consume. So uh, what are your thoughts in regards to what, you know, what's going on in, in Washington, D.C. regarding TikTok and the potential ban? I mean, do you view this as part of your livelihood? Like I know you, you said you work for a, a, you know, a company that builds calls and, uh, you know, and has the decoys and all that good stuff. So you have other ways to make a living, but do you view this as if it went away, how would that affect how you reach people? Well, it definitely, I, I've been trying to shift people over to Instagram, but it, man, it's, it really would, it would affect my life for sure. Um, and you know, I, I, I think there's some things are probably a good thing um, if it gets gets rid of it. And I mean, I can see myself sitting there watching TikTok way too much, probably so sometimes. But um, I don't know, man. It's really interesting what's going to go on. But I will say one thing: it's helped me put my call company on the map. You know what I mean? It's yeah. it's it has helped me build build my livelihood today. And we're we're I mean, I can't keep up anymore. It's it, it we, we it's just gone, went from me in a basement building 300 calls a year. I have seven full time employees now. It's crazy. And so, 
you know what I mean? It's just completely changed my life. Um, and it's, and it, it's helped, it's helped get to the other channels. And now hopefully we built the community enough that if it does go away, that we're still around, but no, we're, it's, it's super, it just, it's really been a blessing. And I, I, I mean, if it's gone as part of it and I'm going to continue to keep doing what we're doing and, and, uh, we're just going to keep trying to help people. Yep. I, I got a question for you. It's kind of backtracking a little bit because we got some other stuff we want to go through. Question of the day, wildlife word of the day, all that stuff. But before we do that, I we were talking about it a little bit earlier, but I think for your average guy, the, the average guy listening to this, you, we want to take what we're learning from competition callers and become competent callers, right? That's That's the goal for most of us. So is there one tip or is there one tactic that you've learned by being this great competition caller that translates into the woods to be a competent caller, not the best in the world, but you know, a, a, a competent caller that can call a bird in with a diaphragm call. I, I just, well, I just, what I can tell is that, um, tell people is that man, when it comes to, uh, mouth calling is confidence. Just if you can practice enough that you're confident, that can help out a ton because I, you know, I hear guys that are like having a tough time getting started and they're scared to do it. And so they're, they're thinking more about that than what they're actually saying to the bird, understanding the bird and reading the bird and saying what you want to say when you want to say it um, is more important than any sound quality on this planet. I believe wholeheartedly. I think that, that, and that's, and that goes from waterfowl to elk hunting to turkey hunting. I mean, it's just, being confident with your equipment and being and being confident on saying what you need to say when you need to say it is super important. And that could be a purr. If you if you think that that's what you need to say right now and you're confident enough, it doesn't need to sound like us at all. It needs to. It, you just need to it, fake it till you make it. Almost in my opinion, it, it's it's not a bad thing to be a great caller. But on the other side, it's it's just more important to be confident and 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 be confident in reading that bird, you know, like when it comes to the stuff I've learned, obviously I've learned, you know, it, it, turkey calling out of everything makes turkeys do things that I've never seen them do before. You know, like elk calling, being a phenomenal elk caller, it helps, but it's, I mean, like I'll get those turkeys I used to take me two hours to call in are taking me 10 minutes. You know what I mean? Um, being a good turkey caller. But what I've learned is, man, it's just like the confidence, like that I, call at them very aggressively a lot of times, and then I'll just sh shut up for 10 minutes and just read his temperature. If he gobbles while I'm silent, then he's thinking about me hard. Then I'm going to just scale it back. Mark hunted with me out in Oregon a long time ago, and he was laughing at me. He's like, Bo, you start off strong, and then you you always dial it back where he's the opposite. He starts off soft and gets more aggressive. And what I do is I so I like to set the hook in, get him a, get him looking for me, and then I just slowly back it off and try and get him to come look for me. Yeah, I'm I'm very similar. Um, I'm I'm kind of, uh, I I seem to dive into this. I believe I don't know if you want me to run a call, but I believe uh, 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 soft. Again, I mentioned this earlier in the podcast. Your your ability to learn to back off and do the soft sounds is going to increase your your kill rate on turkeys it just will real quick give us an example well, um we, we, we'd have Bo just for you guys listening or watching we tested this out a, ahead of time but unfortunately like we use zoom to have our guests call in when these guys turkey call we we ran into this last year it clips the audio and yeah. so you can't actually hear what they're they're doing so steve we tested the audio equipment out here he's going to give us an example of what we're talking about otherwise we'd have Bo do it for us uh, but go ahead, Steve. So, Bo, as you know, uh, Sound of Spring, when your Uncle Mark and, and, and your dad and all of us got together, Keith Wallach, Jeff Probst, yep. Randy Panic, our yep. good buddy. Dinker. Randy, Randy Panic, Dinker, Dale Whiffler. We all got together and did Sound of the Spring. And one of the things that I taught in Sound of Spring is how to do a cluck and purr. I do no different now. I do the end of my tongue like that. Only I put a mouth call in my mouth. I'm going to take this mic away from my mouth. I go, only I sound chamber it. Yeah. 
So that soft stuff that I just did, that, that clear soft stuff, that's what you need to learn in those tough to kill turkeys and what Bo's talking about, backing down on your call. And that's all you got to do, everyone. Once they notice you're there, mm -hmm. what I just gave is all you got to do every well, once let, in a while. Let me ask you guys. So if, it, if you're going down to the soft stuff, is there a, a certain range that you feel like the turkey needs to be within? So like, it's like, man, I think he's about a couple hundred yards away. And, and that, that's the last time I heard him gobble. Are you still calling pretty loud to try to, to try to reach him? Or you're saying you, you go into that soft stuff. What you Personally and Bo elaborate on this. I back off and, and, and if they answer, I know they can hear me. That's the level I want to be at. Yeah. And I, I, I will say one thing, you know, they can hear that it, it, it's just amazing how far they can hear you with the clucking and purring and the soft stuff. Like they can hear me scratching leaves at 200 yards in the woods. You know what I mean? If, and, and so like, if he's, if he's gobbling, um, a lot of times I'll back it off. The only time that I get loud is like, I like to pop their bubble. Like if I get in his bedroom and I, gah, 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 and he's like, Pow! like, that, you know, that just, it's like I take what I do with elk calling, and that's what in that scenario, you know what I mean? And elk calling, you're popping their bubble, trying to get them turned towards you and coming. But man, I, I that soft stuff, it just it's just absolutely incredible how far they can hear it. It just it, it's uncanny. It is amazing that the turkey I got the other just a couple mornings ago in Alab in South Alabama, the one I mentioned earlier in the podcast, he didn't gobble on on a roost hardly until I called. This is as loud as I ever got with him. And I didn't call that much, Bo, at all to this turkey. That was it. That was it. That was as and, loud as I got. And I think that's the, those, you guys, that's still pretty next level. Like as, as I'm, you, you were talking about confidence and practicing a lot. So I've been, and I'm sure Tim's doing the same thing. We got a long drive to work. Like I've been practicing in the truck to and from work, you yeah. know, hour drive each way. And I, I'm just trying to be confident. So I'm trying to make sure that I have consistency to it. I, I off uh, air, I was telling Steve 75% of the time, it sounds pretty good. Like it's, I'm like, okay, this sounds like I could get, I got the cadence down. I can get a turkey to, to respond to this, but it's like that every 25% <laughs> and, and it's just random. It, it's you just terrible sounding. It's yeah. real screechy or it's real high. And it's like that, like, is there a go-to you're talking about some intricate type of calling? I feel like, because, because it's you're clucking and purring and you're soft calling for your average guy. Is there a go to, you know, like, hey, it, it, when all else fails, just start here and try to do these basic elemental things? Is it, Bo, is there something that you would recommend there? Just the, the Yelp, man, just get, like, then Josh Cross the Barker told me a long time ago, just get, the, try and get your Yelp where it's solid and everything else will fall into place. Hmm. You know what I mean? Okay. Uh, and, and I, and I mean, I, I have no problem run if you if you can't purr with a mouth call then run a pot call. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a bad thing. There's you always. know what I mean? It's it's and I, I still find myself using them. And uh, you know, there's sometimes it kind of drives me wild that uh, they are answering it too because I'll just put out the prettiest Yelp I've ever put out in my life. And my buddy grabs his box call <laughs> and it's just a, it's one of it's one of those aggressive yeah. Yeah, and I'm your buddy. I love Boston, but it was that's me. It's a gnarly one, and and the bird's just like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> like that's awesome. Uh, Bo, to your to your point, um, it, it's no great secret. Well, in the turkey calling world, at least those that, that follow the National Wild Turkey Federation and convention and turkey calling, um, I kind of I lost my way in turkey calling. I I, I got to where basically I retired, start judging the Grand National Finals and uh, different competition and uh to find my way back in a top level competition i had to relearn how to how to uh develop a a, a really <laughs> good yelp i had lost a good yelp i had cutting fly down the soft stuff cluck i had all that got away from the basics i got away from the basic good sounding yelp give us an example real quick of a good sounding yelp so i do so i do a rollover yelp um, and so I, I, I build my calls, I build my own calls, which you do too as well. Right, Bo. Okay. Yeah. So, and so I do a real light side tension and, and, and zero back tension. So it's a, it's a softer, you can feather the call. And that's how I learned to re, uh, 
have a, have a, a I relearned how to yelp mm-hmm. that that were to bring it to a, a point where it was score in major competition like this. Sounds terrible. Even looks like it when he does it. <laughs> so that, that's obviously fantastic. So is on the cadence, guys, Bo, when you talk about cadence of yelping, how how many yelps is too many? You know, like that there's probably a fine line of kind of continuing to yelp over and over and over. It's too it's too many, it's not realistic. Like, what's the cadence that you would do? It just depends on the scenario. You know, you get your midday yelping when you're I always have different hens in my head that I've heard before. And so my midday hen yelp, I hear, I've heard her so many times, like you, you know, you've been walking all day. I can just paint this picture. You've been walking all day on these logging roads. I couldn't tell you how many times I, I remember her, this one in particular, I'm, I'm walking down this logging road and she, I start, I yelp and she's, ka, 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 ka. then she just, ka, 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 ka. she's searching, you know, so that's, you know, seven notes to nine notes you know mm. but you know first thing in the morning you hear ah, ah, ah. three notes you know five notes you're trying you, if you don't really act like you care about it, it's adding emotion so the amount of times you're doing it and speed and everything like that can either show that you don't care about the tom and you're just happy and content versus and it's just so amazing that this one sound one yelp could portray all these different things mm. it could mean you're kind of just i'm right here I'm over here. I don't care about you. Get over here right now. I'm pissed off at your hen. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. All say. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. So, it, it's that, that's the detail that I love you guys diving into. Yeah. I appreciate you guys getting into that before we jump into some of the other stuff here. That that's sounds awesome, Steve, oh. as always. And thanks for the explanation, uh, Bo. So Tim, what's next here? Okay. Question of the day. All right. So uh, the question of the day is brought to you by HS Strut DOD Series Signature Calls. Check out the full line of Dre Outdoor Signature Turkey Calls designed by six-time world champion Mark Drury and approved by the DOD team. That must be Terry Drury, <laughs> Tim, <laughs> and <decision> Matt. The makers. <laughs> not approved anything because we, we don't not, not qualified. Said, I said to you off camera or off podcast earlier that Terry Drury is an excellent call. He's fun. Uh, he's fun to go with. He and is. and. Uh, it, and I know the amount of practicing he does, it's that morning in his trailer before he goes for the first day. <laughs> yeah. He's calling a little bit over by the the, the washer and dryer. And that's and him peeling the reeds apart. That's right. Old, yeah. Yeah. Old, old man winter can still call. All right. So from this one's from this question's from uh, our YouTube community over at Dre Outdoors. Uh, looks like from WV Deer 8643. He says, what's your favorite decoy preference? Hen? Jake Gobbler or Combo. So, Bo, what's your favorite decoy preference? If I want to see one come running in, I'm going to run a I'm going to run a gobbler and a feeding hen. If I want if I want to see them run as hard as they've ever run in their life, <laughs> that's how, that's how I like it. So, you know, it's interesting because I I feel like. Mark and those guys tend to use the Jake a lot, the yes. Jake and a feeder or, you know, a lay down hen or something like that. But I, I've never asked them this. I, sh- I should <laughs> is why, why, why the response in that way? Because a lot of times when I see Jake's, you know, when we're hunting and there's a group of Jake's, it always scares off the long beards, right? Mm-hmm. They're always bullying them around and pushing them off. But is it because it's one single Jake versus several do you guys know what the difference there would be or why they react that way in, in my ahead. opinion too you know that the jake um it, it just one jake is 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 a perfect example it's one jake with a hen so it's they're not nearly going to be near as scared of it you know where you know my like if i run a tom decoy it, like it'll bump off two-year-olds you know what i mean yeah. if it's not the tom that's ready to fight i i and, and what i i love about that is is that if I have an extra day to hunt, he comes in, sees that strutter decoy doesn't come into it. They're usually still gobbling. I'll just ditch the decoy and go shoot them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and I so. I absolutely agree with Bo. The combination, Jake and hen decoy. And personally, I've seen no difference between an alert hen or a feeding hen, but a hen with the Jake 
And I agree with you, Bo, that, that's, that's where you'll get your most consistent response where they'll, it'll suck them right to you. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I, think they're, I think they're not as intimidated by one Jake as they are a full strut type of adult gobbler. So, so Bo, when you're putting out a full strut adult gobbler, what's you, is it an older turkey that tends to come in? Is it a three-year-old or older? What, what's the difference? What, what makes them run in versus a Jake no, having a Jake out? I just seem to get the binders. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's, I couldn't, my, my rule of thumb is full fan, frying pan. I don't care how nice. old they are. So, uh, <laughs> I like you it. Know. No, no, I get that part. I, did, I guess I don't, I don't understand the difference of what type of turkey is coming in after that. that's run into your setup there that you explained, the full strut uh, gobbler in a hen versus, say, having a jake out it's, in a hen. It's not a submissive tom. Mm -hmm. How about that's the best way to explain it. It's not necessarily that it's a specific tom that's going to come in. The ones that aren't going to come in are the ones that got their butt kicked. Got it. So that bird. makes sense. It's the one, it, and so any of the other toms, maybe the two-year-olds, you'll see them every morning. They come run together and are gobbling at each other, hit each other every day, and then they go and do their own thing. Big dog ends up with the with the hens, but he's still a fighter. Hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. And so it's just kind of interesting, you know, that you, and you'll find them that you'll find mm -hmm. birds that uh, the, the ones that actually get beat up. Like every time they turn around or get hit, those are the ones that see a decoy and they go. Yeah, they stop no, shutting, they kind of dive off in the bushes. Got it. Got it. Good info. <clears throat> All right, let's jump into the question of the day. It's uh, uh, that's the it's the wildlife word actually. <laughs> Tim. <laughs> it's uh it's written question of the day. The wildlife word is brought to you by the question of the day. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's brought to you by Blocker Outdoors, the finisher series. We uh, had Kevin on a couple weeks ago talking about that, built specifically for the avid turkey hunter. Uh, so what's the term for the initial pecking through of a turkey egg by a poult? <clears throat> so when they initially bust through, is it called A, the slam dance, B, pipping, C, an existential breakthrough, uh -huh. um, D, the beginning of the end. <laughs> All right, so Bo, we always let the guests go first. So, what's the term for the initial pecking through of a turkey egg by a poult? Slam dance, pipping. So, I'm 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 a I grew up raising turkeys. I'm a huge bird nerd, 4 h -er, and and I have to answer it with the actual. It's pipping is an actual term, and but man, I ah oh dude, I just I love it. That's I, I've held turkey turkey eggs in my hand when I was raising them. And just watching them pop out, and then no and, way, and they imprint on you. Oh, it's so cool! So, and then they be, they're like they're like dogs. <laughs> they're so <laughs> so so they break through making that noise. <laughs> That's why they call. They're, they are making that noise within forty eight hours before. Oh, really? Inside the egg. Is the egg? Yeah, is there in there? Go. And you're cradling them saying, you you don't know how many of you I've taken lives <laughs> of. It's, it's Full fan, frying pan. You're going to help me get better. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So B, I'm going with his answer. B. <laughs> Steve. Steve. Oh, it's got to be pipping. Yes. I like it. It's like pimping. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it ain't easy. I was say. I'll spell it for people. <laughs> pipping -P -P ain't easy. P-I-P-P-I-N-G. Pipping ain't easy. All right. It sure ain't. It's a good one. All right. All well, right. We're, we're going to link up Bo's socials uh, in the show notes so people can follow them if they aren't already. They probably are. Yeah. Bo, uh, where, where can we find you at on Instagram and Twitter real quick? Instagram is bowhunter66, B-E-A-U, hunter66. And TikTok. I don't know. I think is it at Bo Brooks seven over on TikTok? I think it is. Yep. yep. Right yeah. On. So I would uh, highly encourage y'all to go follow this man. He's doing some great stuff. And uh, last, but certainly two, two, two more things before we go. I know Tim's like got a meeting. He's got to jump in too. So sorry, Tim. Sorry. Two, two last things. First of all, over on DeerCast for turkey season, they're running a special. You can save thirty percent on DeerCast Ooh. April first through April fifteenth. This is new. This for new DeerCast users. Uh, get thirty percent off your entire first year of DeerCast. Uh, we'll have a link in the description. Uh, get DeerCast now for turkey season and have it all deer season. 
So, okay, that's that. And then one last thing I want to mention, uh, Mossy Oak has a uh, documentary that they're coming out with called this The Colonel awesome. and the Fox. Uh, it premieres Wednesday, April 3rd. Should be, if we if this airs on April 3rd, this should be the same day, yeah. over on Mossy Oak's YouTube channel. It's kind of going through uh, Mr. Fox, everybody knows. He's Toxie Hayes' father and um, part of that great greatest generation. And then uh, The Colonel, who wrote uh, Colonel Tom Kelly. Kelly. who is the author of the cult classic, the 10th Legion. And it talks about kind of their paths towards helping save the wild Turkey mm -hmm. in the South and, uh, on separate paths, but, but working towards the same goals. And I look forward to seeing this documentary. So I wanted to, uh, real quick, give him a shout out. I was able to visit the Mossy Oak headquarters at guest of Toxie Hayes himself, and he gave me a personal tour of the new Mossy Oak Golf Course. Nice. Sweet. Got to play it the next day, and I parred two holes. Oh, oh nice. I like golf talk. Legitimate pars. Okay, not okay. like kick the ball and no, <laughs> back no, into the fairway. No, drop an extra. No. That's how Mark and Terry play, by the way. <laughs> but uh, Toxie and the Mossy Oak, Bill Sugg, Toxie Hayes, Greg Sugg, the, all the Mossy Oak family was uh, gracious hosts. I stayed in their in their condo down there on the golf course, got to play the course, and Toxie showed me around. He's so proud of that. Oh, sure. And he's oh, no, very no. proud of this new Th film coming out. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it uh, premieres April 3rd at 7 p.m. Central, and uh, I implore you to go take a look I implore you. on Moss Yoke's YouTube channel. All right, Bo. <sighs> Thank you very much for joining us. It's been really, really enjoyable to chat with you. And uh, do you have any parting shots before we uh, before we get off here? I, I don't have a whole lot, but I can say that uh, thank you guys for having me. And Steve, you're awesome. And I, I know that I'm uh, probably going to get back to Mark, but Mark is one of my favorite people on the planet. So, you know, you uh, about wore him out when you hunted with him. I mean, he literally said I couldn't keep up with the kid. I just could not keep up with him. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, he's... He's, he's a young gun. He's Mark, a young gun. A legend. <laughs> Mark's got new knees. So we'll see what happens. Since you are a young gun, uh, pr promise me, we've talked about this in texting. Um, I'll, let's let's uh, share a tree together someday soon. I, I'd love that. That'd be awesome. I would love that, too. As long as you don't kill me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, by walking. If you want to hunt mountain turkeys with me, man, that's just where I get people is when we're hunting them in the mountains. I, mm. <laughs> I tell you what, we're going to have Bo back on for an elk part back in the summertime. So. Yeah, that'd be cool. All right. Well, we appreciate you, buddy, and good luck getting back out there today turkey hunting. And uh, I guess that's it for today's right. episode. See you on the next Young Guns That's edition. right. Until next time, peace out. DeerCast is now supercharged with maps. Get ahead of your game with killer new features like live Doppler radar, wind check out to five days, virtual rain gauges, GPS path tracking, and more. Plus, get our 14-day revolutionary DeerCast prediction and access to DeerCast track. Prep, predict, and pursue with DeerCast. We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DOD TV is brought to you by DeerCast. Prep, predict, and pursue your target buck.